Hello, everyone, and welcome to the New Normal Speaker Series. My name is Joko Muratovsky, and I'm the director of the Ullman School of Design. My special guest today is Randall Wilson. Randy and I work closely together. He's both a fashion design professor and a diversity and inclusion coordinator at the Ullman School of Design. Randy, welcome to the New Normal Speaker Series. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. You hold a special place here in the school. You also act as a mentor, ally, and a role model for both our Black design students and uh, students from the LGBTQ community. Why it is important for students from underrepresented minorities to have role models and mentors? Um, so they have a blueprint to uh, navigate through the complexities of life. And um, I don't know. Um, a role model is pretty lofty. Thank you for that. Um, I would like to, you know, see myself as an example, um, as an, an example or an alternative to what's been fed to a lot of young people, especially young Black um, and um, Hispanic, Asian, um, you know, young people who are creatives who may be uh, LGBTQI. Um, it's really, really, really important um, to have examples of um of achievement and um progress and tenacity if nothing else tenacity to know that they can hang in there and make a difference and be the difference and and also you know um from for students coming from underprivileged backgrounds who may be first generation students coming to university who may come from financially disadvantaged uh households um for them, it's also very important to have somebody that can understand them and oh, that, can, that they can talk to about the challenges of school, of university, and so on, which they cannot probably get at home. Absolutely. Um, I can speak upon that. Yeah, I couch surfed. Um, you know, I lived all the way out in Tri County at the time in the, 80, in the early 80s, late 70s. Um, that bus would stop running at seven o'clock in the evening. So I had to make a decision to either end what I needed to do in town at school on campus early or just connect with friends and say, hey, can I crash you a house? So I was basically a nomad for several, several years while I was in school. And um, that's falling on the sword. And I'm glad I did it because um, I knew I needed to that, you know, this was my calling and and, um, you know, because I look at my, what I do as a gift, you know, um, and I take that very, very seriously. And I'm very grateful for that. Um, so um, what I would like to tell to young people is to move and sacrifice all that you can, because you'll get all that back. You know, you'll get all of that back. And then some, you know, if you first make that first sacrifice for your talent or your gift. Yeah, your own personal story is a story of overcoming adversity in many ways. Uh, would you mind sharing a little bit more about your own life journey and uh, how difficult it was for you to actually pursue your interest in the fashion industry? Well, um, I have a lot of Miss Gladine, that's my mom, in me. So, and I have the, um, the tenacious and the gift from my father because he was a master carpenter and um, he made a lot of our furniture. So I definitely got my gift from my father. Um, so with that, those two energies just propelled me forward. And also understand I come from a different generation. I come from a generation of um, kick ass and take names. You know, um, I was born in 1960. So, you know, there's that, you know, I've seen, I was on the front lines of biases. I mean, really brutal, ugly, nasty, um, instances, you know, I remember being a, a kid and, and going out with my mom to eat somewhere, you know, with my siblings and um, we were asked to leave many times or wasn't served. So I have those like classic um, racism experiences. Um, but coming through high school, you know, um, you know, I was in AP art classes before that's what they called them. Um, they called them um, the same difference. They called them advanced classes. And so, um, you know, um, and I, you know, and it was really interesting because through high school and all those art classes and I took commercial art, which is uh, now I believe um, graphic um, design, um, which is the new term. The old term is commercial art that you hear on, um, you know, old sitcoms. 
And so, you know, I was really advanced in terms of um, honing um, my gift. Um, so, and I was always the only one. I was always the only black. And um, in that instance, all through UC, um, interesting thing about UC, when I got to UC, uh, there was this thing, university college, where they would kind of pigeonhole a lot of the black students in, um, which has now been um, uh, eradicated. Um, it is now just arts and science. But then there's that discrimination in politics. Um, and in, you know, just in my professional life, you know, doing visual merchandising, um, you know, just the use, you know, being the only one in the 80s, in the early 80s is really interesting because they figured, ah, let him in, what harm can it do? You know, he's the only one. Um, and I was treated like an anomaly and, um, and um, you know, and like an exotic, quite frankly, and objectified. But however, um, while you were watching me, I was watching you. So I learned how to use that, um, that my physical to my advantage. And, um, you know, and just kind of, you know, once they saw the work I did, you know, a lot of that, it didn't really change their minds. And I want people to understand that. You kept saying talent would change their minds. Mm, no, it won't. <laughs> They'll respect you for your talent. They'll respect the work you do and the money that you generate from the work you do. But their minds, you know, they'll be relaxed, but not necessarily changed. So you have to really kind of, uh, and I'm speaking pretty much more or less like an old head. So young people have to understand as much change is happening, there's a lot of change that isn't. So they need to like really un, um, settle on, do you want to have a relaxed um, perception of who you are and what you do, or do you want to change it, you know? Change is the optimal, but um, you know you also have to be mature enough to know that you, you know you can't change everything, everybody, because it's in it's in the DNA of America, it's in the soil, you know, and we're digging up old bodies of discontempt, disenfranchisement, all those things we're digging up now, and um, it's ugly. So, so you were the only black uh, design student at the time, and uh... yeah. And, and later uh, you became the only black male faculty in the school. <laughs> That's what I wrote in a um, bio about how poetic that is, however, you know, and I was groomed for that, you know. That's why I didn't flinch or have up defenses that I see a, a lot of young black men um, in creatives, because there's that um, identity issue, being a creative, being a man of color, you know, that's huge. I don't think um, the populace understands how um, for a black, let's just be specific to Cincinnati. Cincinnati is not the sexiest city. You know, they don't, you don't see a, a lot of colorful people doing colorful things. There's pockets and cliques um, of that, but it's not like a very large visual optic kind of presentation of really cool looking, funky, unconditional people walking around, you know, real talk. So a lot of the young um, black and brown men that would want to have a career in the arts or in fashion, they first have to, um, and I think a lot of you, especially when I was coming through, um, that, you know, fashion equal gay, like, without a doubt, you know, like, oh, you, and you like to dress, you like to draw clothes and all those kind of things, um, you, you know, you have to be gay. And a lot of times that's true. <laughs> and sometimes, I mean, you know, it is what it is. Um, but sometimes it isn't, you know, and uh, I see that with male students now. But yeah, being the only black student, um, then, uh, and then later on, there were a few um, black females, there were actually more black female students than, than male, you know, because even being a male in fashion was super rare then. I look back on it now, and it was fun. However, staff, um, teachers, um, really I, the biases was glaring it was just like textbook it really was and uh, however they knew i knew i couldn't be touched in illustration i knew i was i knew i was gifted and um margie volker you know um dear friend of mine um knew that as well and margie kind of pulled me out in front of everyone and there was flack behind that you know there was flack major flack um when I think about some of the conversations that um, 
that you know got back to me it was joko was uh, whew, it was quite crushing actually you know it's like they, they stepped up um they stepped very close to the line of you know calling me the n-word quite uh, you know and i was paying into this educational system so if you can imagine it then you know it's uh, a lot better now by far um but um you know, that's what it is when you're the only one. They feel like they could prod and pick at you and kind of like devalue you. And uh, I'm like, I'm not moving. You know, unless you move, there'll be no moving, you know? And I think because I had that old soul, because I was born at, when I was born and, you know, came through like some serious discrimination and racism, um, I had that grit, you know? Yeah, the resilience. Yeah, exactly. And I stood as a man and I, and I was very conscious about, you know, living in my truth, which sounds very corny to me now. Um, but, you know, being fully present, you know, being unconditionally black, gay, gifted, you know, and all those things, you know, and, um, you know, cause there was no place else to run. Where are you going to run to? And how long are you going to keep running? And, and how long are you going to keep running into that wall? I think that's what anyone should ask themselves and what a lot of young people, I think, you know, need to sit down and have a real um, spirit talk with themselves about, because, you know, you can never excel at anything until you're, you know, until that internal house is cleaned. You and I, we, we worked closely since when I arrived in mm -hmm. 2016. And I've been an outsider coming, not learning about the American culture, yeah, as I, as I go along, I didn't brought any of the baggage with me, so we could have um, very different conversations from the from the onset. Exactly. Well, it's just not American culture, Joko. It's Cincinnati culture, which is a different culture on into itself, inside itself. So you had a learning curve about not just American culture, but Midwest culture, yeah. and very conservative. Um, you know, red state, red city culture. And the fact that a lot of the employees, you know, of tenure tract and all that, you know, either lives in one of three places, the West side, deep glass like Clifton, which is very affluent or um, um, in the Rookwood area, you know, Hyde Park. So what is happening, and I believe what is what is you know like faculty and staff are grappling with with all this diversity and inclusion change, is that you know you're trying to change something when you don't have a relationship with it, you know you don't have a relationship with black students, you know I think, and I said this in a meeting as well. I think you know for a white staff, and this isn't an indictment indictment by any means, but a lot of times you leave where you see you know a lot of different difference in a lot of um, different looking people. And then you go to your um, prospective homes and you see no difference whatsoever. So there's a disconnect. So there's no investment. You know, how much culture do you in, do you invest in and do you um, consume? That's, you know, I don't think that really resonated on a lot of people. I think that went over a lot of people's heads, but you know, the fact that I know, um, you know, a lot about a lot of Eurocentric European white fashion and style. That's because I consumed it. That's why I can teach it. You know, I teach, um, you know, uh, European uh, Euro European um, concept of design and illustration back to Europeans because I've consumed it because I've been taught it. And you can't teach anything about black culture unless you have invested in consuming it. That's just completely the bottom line. And we keep going around in circles and meetings and not letting that really sit in our souls to where that needs to happen. You know, whatever you need to do, I don't know what that means to you, how you consume it. Um, you know, cause all this talking is dizzying. I have need a drama me cause we are just talking in circles about the same thing, but yeah. Um, and, and it took an outsider to come in to shake things up and to, um, you know, the fact that you even took the time to, um, you know, talk to the students, you know, as many times as you did in my classroom um, is a whole new thing, you know, 
I think there's a prevalence of passivity and, and, um, and um, um, passive aggression prevalent, not only in the city, but in DAP, you know, um, there's a lot of appropriation and a lot of protocol that gets in a way um, that gets all of that is, in, is like a wall of comfort. You know, if I'm nice to you, that clearly means I'm not racist. Then that clearly means you're scared, you know, of who you are and how you feel about anything. So until we, you know, tear down that wall of comfort, there'll be no walls of, there'll be nothing, there'll be no change, you know. So mm -hmm. you've been an agent of, kind of showing, um, you know, the comfort culture to itself. Thanks, Randy. Mm -hmm. I always um, believed in the contribution you, you are making here. Thank you. By representing a different voice and standing always for the students, especially right. students who are different, who see themselves as different to the others. So you have always been a great advocate for that, which is the reason why you are actually in this particular role right now. I mean, it has been a role in, in, the, make, in, a, in the making <laughs> right. for a few years. <laughs> you know, it didn't just happen. No, it didn't. Time. And the students, you know, the thing of it is too, which is really, I feel super grateful about, is that there is an undercurrent of, even though professionally I wasn't able to stretch, and I still have faith that I will be able to, um, but even though there was an undercurrent, I mean, there were, I wasn't able to like, you know, stretch and excel um, in other aspects. There was the, always that undercurrent of, um, you know, of work that I did with the students that wasn't documented or even, you know, and it was very personal, very one-on-one, -on -one, not just black students, but white students as well, who felt, um, you know, like not heard or, you know, like, didn't it really, you know, you know what it is, the reason why I felt like I've had that kind of undercurrent following, underground follow, following is because um, being authentic, you know, like young people see when someone is real, you know, that's the thing. They have laser sharp vision when somebody is really giving it to them for real. And I think um, too often, you know, um, some educators, um, don't render themselves um, transparent or vulnerable to students. You know that doesn't mean you come in and talk about your personal life or any of that, but you are um, you show up fully who you are. You know, and uh, if you don't know, then you don't know. Say you don't know, um, and if you listen to the students, and I think that that's the difference that I think I have made is just listening to young people. You know, and sometimes you never know who these young people are. Sometimes they may not have been listened to their entire young lives, you know. So to have someone that is educating them, listen to them and change. And I, I you know, I will always ask students, so what do you all think? What do you want to do? What should we do next? What would benefit you? And what should you learn to help you draw better? You know, when you hear that coming from a teacher, you know that they have your invested interest, you know? So I think the more, you know, staff talks to students and allow them to change things, you know, within absolute reason, you know? And just, I think just hearing, cause I know when I was, you know, I know when I was young and my father would be laying down the law and, um, you know, we had these family meetings and I would voice my opinion, you know, he would go ahead with what he wanted to do anyway, but at least he heard me, you know, that kind of thing. Hmm. You mentioned earlier appropriation. So what is your take on the frequent cultural appropriation that constantly shows up in the fashion industry? Why is this disrespectful to the communities that serve as a form of inspiration to these designers? Um, because it's putting on our culture without um, investing in our um, talent. Um, you know, when you see designers, you know, like Brave, the hit, like when you cast um, your shows and you only have, and this is very surface, but it still warrants mentioning. When you cast, when a lot of shows cast um, one lone black male from Africa, one lone black female from Africa, like number one, what is wrong with local talent? You know, what is wrong with, you know, black Americans? So, you know what, you know what that is? It's because a lot of the industry doesn't have a history 
of um, a ugly, ugly history of racism and um, um, with Africans, however they do with Black Americans. And the, the look of, you know, someone being from Somalia or, you know, Ghana is so extreme in terms of beauty that it doesn't match the Europe European standard of view, you, you follow me? So if you if you cast um, a black American female, she's like in line with the European beauty. So they wanna show those extremes. Like, oh, this is exotic, different. However, this is, you know, what's beautiful. So that's interesting and layered. And, yeah, and the other part is, um, you know, the styling and just the references, you know, references, like I remember Galeano referenced um, an African tribe with the women that wear the rings around their necks. And it was all of one black woman. You're gonna use uh, you know, the, the beauty of an elongated neck that clearly came from an African tribe and have one black woman that is again from Africa. That's, that's almost, that's just, that's just glaring stereotype right there. You know, and it's, it's the end. And when you look behind the curtain, how many, you know, people are on staff that are designing for these companies, you know, how many um, um, black and brown or, you know, when they reference um, um, Latin culture um, and there are no Latin, you know, design staff, that's what it is. It's just, you know, if you're gonna use the culture, you know, um, use the culture, you know, invest in the culture, not just exploit it. You know, all very interesting points. And um, <clears throat> we have to also look at things in a more complex ways. We live in times of uh, great social unrest right now and racial divide, especially in the United States. In 2013, the Black Lives uh, Matter movement started as a social media response against violence and systemic uh, racism, so, uh, racism toward uh, Black people. Uh, today, this movement has grown to become a global phenomenon. How are you personally experiencing the Black Lives Matter movement? Uh, and um, how do you see elements of that uh, showing up in, uh, in your classes? Um, very powerfully, but subtly. Um, I see black students drawing themselves. That's a very strong statement. Um, and I saw it as, re I didn't really see it in 2013 when Black Lives uh, Matter movement really hit. And let's be clear, that, that, or that, was, that started from a tweet. That started from a tweet from a young black woman and her, and her um, gay friends. And that's, and I think that's the, uh, that's part of the um, story that people are missing. That not only are these young black people that tweeted each other, does our lives even matter? Because there have been so many, so many um, situations where black men and women were unarmed and killed in the street on camera, you know. Um, and how can you see someone clearly shoot somebody in the back and die, and then hover over them, and then that police officer gets off. So there was a lot of incidents up to 2013, let's be clear. So that started as a tweet, started as a tweet um, between um, you know, a young black woman and, and her LGBTQI friends. And then they, they just start tweeting and then they uh, had a blog that turned into a YouTube page and it just propelled into that, you know why? Because there were more incidences happening after 2013. There was the Michael Brown, there was the Trayvon Martin, and on and on. There was uh, Tamir Rice in Cleveland, a child that was shot playing. A police officer got out of their car with their, with their guns drawn. They didn't even pull up, ask him any questions. They got, up, got out their car, shot this 12 year old child. He, they got off. Um, there were incidences here, you know, um, um, James DeBose, um, you know, it was just so many things going on. And I see it showing up in class by not only the black students drawing, representing people of color in their sketches, but also the white students, because white students have black friends and um, have black boyfriends and girlfriends, you know. Um, these young people are different. This generation is different because they grew up um, consuming other people's culture. 
genuinely, you know, because when I when I allow the students to play music and I love music and fat and uh, the drawing class because music and fashion are inseparable. Um, so when we're playing music very loudly, sometimes I might add, <laughs> uh, they're playing songs that I grew up with. They're playing Stevie Wonder as well as Jay Z. You know, that's powerful. That's how it's showing up in my classroom. And it just warms my heart to no degree. You know, when I hear a white student on their playlist has Shaka Khan, you know, I mean, my work here is done. You know, I don't know if they're doing that to impress me or I'm impressed. And um, I will say, I will even say to the student, what you know about that, you know, and which is also a rap song. So, <laughs> you know, I hear my culture being fed back to me from white students who are consuming it. And I'm telling you, um, the parents of these young people, um, these are, your children are different. That your child is gonna be the change that you need to be. And if you just allow it, if you just allow it. Now, let's be fair, not all students are on that change boat. They're, they are not, uh, however, and that's fine, you know, and that's their journey. You know, one thing I've learned to do is not, why aren't you changing? I think that's the disconnect a lot of people have. It's like they try to like, you know, be in people's face about there's change happening. Why aren't you changing? No, 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 no. Let people change when they need to change, you know, because um, it will happen to them. It's spiritual. If people allow people to like get the spirit of change, then, you know, um, God will take care of the rest. You know, it is not you, just like trying to force somebody to come out. You know, you can't force anybody to do anything that's so personal to them. You know, you have got to allow them to journey through that to through to their truth. You know, you can't force truth down anybody's throat. And I think that's um, what the what the right is looking at. And they feel the left is guilty of that. You know, however, both parties are not, you know, without fault by any means. You know, I don't mean parties, but no, neither train of thinking is without fault with that, but that's how it's showing up in my classroom and it's quite amazing. And um, there's this discussion, it shows up in critiques um, cause you know, I'm just not a drawing class. I'm also an art therapist. <laughs> so, uh, you know, when we have critiques I challenge students not just to draw a pretty picture about some miscellaneous gowns I have them put it in the context of, um, you know, a storyline, you know, when they do a collection, what are you saying with this collection? You know, what are your references? You know, and I have them document that in their uh, mood boards and all those kind of things. So there's ways that faculty can interject, you know, diversity and inclusion and start conversations. They just have to be not afraid to do that. So what do you think design schools could address better in terms of curricula, internal culture, learning environments? to enable such a, you know, uh, such diversity to thrive. Okay, so it might be some hurt feelings. So let's start with talent. I think every university can start with hiring talent. That's the problem. If, if you don't hire people that have at least talent, look, it breaks down into three camps, gift, talent, and skill. You wanna hire the gift. You wanna hire someone who's anointed to do what they're doing. So if you can get a gifted um, applicant, um, they will have the passion, they will have the wherewithal, they will have everything that any university would need to generate revenue because it is a business. So if you have enough gifted people, then they will bring notoriety, in, invention, um, everything, all that. Even if you hire someone that's talented, they will at least, Talent is really skill shined and buffed into a diamond. Gift is a spiritual unconsciousness of instinct. So um, that's what separates the two. And skill is just someone who is a good student, who is studious and have like chiseled and worked and muscled their way through the process to at least do it and have the machine, meaning, you know, the computer and all the programs and Photoshop, that skill, you know. So we're cranking out a lot of skilled um, creators, you know, let's, be, I mean, let's, I'm just gonna say it, you know, but it starts at the top with faculty. If there was enough, at least talented faculty, 
that would be a, a change agent. And um, underneath that, not just, you know, um, you know, because when these searches happen for um, um, professors and staff, um, they happen with, again, comfort. You know, they happen because, you know, it gets back to consuming, you know, because you're not consuming any, you, oh, now you're going to consume it like, oh, we need to like, oh, why don't we look at the, um, um, you know, creative um, sites where, you know, Black and Indian people are. Now that's happening. It took all this long time. You know, and I think that's some of the part of this gruntlement from the students, because I remember being young, like, you know, and really holding people's you know, feet to the fire and complaining about why didn't this happen sooner, you know, um, that noise will like dissipate if um, that noise will would dissipate if also talent was connected to that. I think it's just students want to see. So what are you doing? Professor, teacher, what are you, you know, what are you bringing to the table? Who are you? How'd you get this job? I, I have actually been asked that. I have actually, I have actually had those at court. I, I'm kid you not, kid you not. And this was before computers. This was like when I, like 2003, like early 2000s, mid 2000s. Students were actually like, ask me questions as if I were in a job interview. Really? That's what, you really, that's what I've experienced. And um, and then when I, at the time, I would ask, you know, other, um, you know, professors and teachers who were once my students in staff meetings. And they were like, no, nobody has ever asked me that. So, oh, I'm like, oh, so it's just me. You know? Why do you think? Well, because I was black. Because they were, they had never had a black teacher. That's the other thing. Um, a lot of these young white kids coming to the school never, ever have they ever had a black teacher. It's amazing. I just kind of casually ask that each and every year. It's gotten very marginally better. You know, I mean, like before they were zero, now it's like two, three students who said they've had. So it's really, so they're coming from a system. Oh, and I've gotten some of the most crazy, horrendous stories of their high school experiences, like um, Ursula, um, um, just, just different schools, private schools here in town that have had like crazy race, racial incidences that they've experienced and that the school didn't know how to handle it. They just ignored it. It's, I, you know, one of the valuable things is that um, white students, you know, don't like uh, want to participate or invest in that way of thinking and they, and they want to purge themselves. And when they see um, like, like with me, they just let, they just give me all this information. It's really amazing. Um, and they, they kind of give me a view from the other side, which is invaluable. And, um, so it's a whole lot of work to be done in the public school system or in the private school sector here in town. It's, it's really amazing, but they, yeah, I've had white students, um, interview me clearly, not, not lately, not anymore. Cause you know, now they kind of look you up. You know, that they will Google you while you're talking to them. So, um, um, so there's that advantage. But up until, I would say, 2014, that recent, 2014 is when the interviewing stopped. Hmm. Yeah. Randy, what would be your advice to any underrepresented minority students struggling with the acceptance of their own identity and self-worth? Be present. Um, I think that's less of an issue now for young people than when I was, you know, coming up. Um, it was but still is probably for some. Yeah, for some. I think, um, to be quite frank and quite real, um, I think it's less of a problem for white students than it is for Blacks especially, and I always say, especially black men, because, you know, that's who I am, what I am. And I see that struggle, even with men my age who aren't even out, who are married and living a lie. That's still a thing. Um, I would say just be present and um, be present, be present. Now, I don't mean publicly or anything, because a lot of times when people say that they want you to uh, it's a numbers game. When you hear, be present in your life, in your truth. Um, and they don't know what that means individually to people. You know, they, they're they looking at, when I hear, 
the LGBTQI community saying that they want numbers, more or less. Be present so we can count you as one of us and you can and you, you know that there's a lot of, you know, so they're not having any parts of that. When I say be present, I mean be present within your own self, in your own present, um, in your own person. Young people who are dealing with identity issues must first come to the conclusion of who they are and be fine with that. Because until they sit down with their own selves and their own spirit and their own, within themselves, there, there's no other conversation that needs to be had. They'll just run on um, the physicality of who they are. They're physically act out sexually. And that's how all this chaos happens, you know? Um, that's how AIDS happens. That's how STDs happen. When you, when you sexually act out without the affirmation of who you are, that is what that, that's exactly what that is. And I have lived through the fire, lost so many friends to the virus, um, to the point that I have to recalibrate my uh, perception of, of um, sexuality and friendships. And it's really, it's really heavy. And then to be in a, in a heavy discipline um, art school like that, you know, so there's a lot swirling around for students, but if they can just like be fair and be honest about who they are within themselves to themselves and surround themselves with people who are of like mind and like truth, you know, cause you need, you can only do so much with inside yourself before you, you need a support system. And I don't mean going to the office, LGBTQI, you know, it serves a purpose, but it's not really nuanced. Those students are clicked off and, you know, it is what it is. It's good that the university has that, but, um, you know, I'm saying that they need to be around someone that they can relate to, you know, kind of thing. And um, that's what that is, you know. Wise words, Randy. Thank you. Thank you so much for your time today. Absolutely, uh, thank you for having me. I always enjoy talking with you. So thank you for me talking to you, sharing well. your experience and your insights. Absolutely. And I hope that whoever sees this, you know, will, you know, digest it, you know, um, and, you know, in a, in, in a different way and not be a break, you know, not be, um, you know, just, just allow the information in, you know, cause that's how change happens. If you just be still and allow it in. Well, I think it's important for us to have these conversations and just to see different sides of the spectrum and right. you to be able to see, uh, to, to say how you see the world from your own perspective is very valuable, you know, because nobody can have that position except you. Right. And um, it's really becoming clear to me um, why I'm still here, why I'm still around. You know, it's very cathartic. You have no idea. You know, I mean, it is really... I mean, it's such a Holy Ghost experience, you know, to know that this is exactly why I needed you here at this time in this place. That shakes me to my core, you know, to have that be so obvious. Thank you You're for welcome. everything you do for our students and for us, Randy. And I uh, thank you as well, Joko. Thank you.